Good afternoon. My name is Elise Brunel and I'm the Managing Director of Cape Town Opera in South Africa. And thanks very much for joining us. It's our second webinar. Um, the first one we had a week ago was really fantastic about a new Isikosa language opera that was commissioned by Cape Town Opera and UCT. And this week we're moving uh, to a different subject. I, I was giving some thought about what I'd like to discuss and with whom. And I thought I'd love to reach out to some leaders who were born in Africa, born in South Africa, and who are currently leaders in the performing arts field at various, place, various places around the world. And what are they doing now? And what are they planning on doing next year that is different, that is perhaps a radical thought um, in light of COVID? So with that thought, um, I reached out to three individuals that I'm really thrilled can join us today. But before we get to introductions, I want to thank our webinar team at Cape Town Opera, Leslie, Dean, and uh, Daniel. Thanks very much. So the subject matter today is brilliant ideas for 2021, African leaders rethinking the arts worldwide. What can we consider doing now that we might have thought was impractical, impossible, irrational, or wrongheaded, but now in light of COVID might actually just be the right idea for next year. How can we engage in this, pand in this pandemic to reposition the arts uh, in, in a stronger way to the broader society? So I was a bit personally inspired by English National Opera coming up with drive-in operas in September. It's a pretty crazy idea, likely something they never would have thought for thought of before, but who else is thinking of interesting ideas out there for 2021? So it's time to uh, have our panelists join the discussion. And the first person I'd like to bring on board is Jay Pather. Jay is going to be joining us from, I believe his family's home in Durban. Jay is the director for the Institute of Creative Arts at the University of Cape Town, which is in the humanities faculty, a really uh, fascinating uh, part of that faculty. It is uh, offering MA and PhD programs in public and live art, a biannual live art festival and publications. Jay also is a curator with the Infecting the City program in Cape Town. He was a Fulbright scholar in New York and he's a choreographer and he was born in Durban. Jay, welcome. Thank you. Thank you very much for having me. Great. The next person I'd like to have join us is Jasper Hope. Jasper uh, is joining us from his home in Dubai. And Jasper's recently uh, left the position of CEO of Dubai Opera. Before that, he was the COO at Royal Albert Hall, and he also worked with AEG and IMG. And he is now the director of Proscenium Arts in Dubai, which is an international cultural and arts consultancy, uh, focusing on advising cultural destinations and working on strategy and sponsorships. And Jasper was born in Durban. So Jasper, welcome very uh, to our panel today. Thanks for joining us. Thank you for having me. Good afternoon, Elise. Great. Uh, and lastly, Adrian Fuchs. Adrian is joining us from his home in New York City in Washington Heights. Adrian is currently the director of special events and festivals at Carnegie Hall. And prior to that, he was a senior strategist at La Placa Cohen and also with the Chamber Music Society at Lincoln Center in artistic and planning and touring. Prior to that, he was in Cape Town and worked with the Chamber Music Society, I'm sorry, that was at Lincoln Center at the Stellenbosch Chamber Music Festival, also with Cape Town Opera. And uh, he was born in Cape Town. So Adrian, welcome to the panel. Thanks for joining us from New York. Thank you, great to be here. Great. All right, I'm gonna kick it off for a question for all of you. Um, whoever wants to jump in, just go for it. Um, I'd like to talk about innovation. In some communities, it's, it's easier to engage artists and arts organizations in projects that are out there, as opposed to some other communities. Um, when I was looking into this, I, I found a, a drive-through first Friday in, in, 
in Colorado where an audience members drove through a, a live dance and music festival. There's the ENO example I talked about before. There's um, a Zoom version of Macbeth that was out there. Um, so people are doing interesting and different things. But in some countries and in some communities, this might not be feasible, might not be the right idea. There's also the argument that sometimes presenting art this way might be cheapening it. It might be giving it too much as little sound bites. And I'd like to know how far you feel you can push the boundaries of art and presentation of art in the communities in which you live and work. Big question, hey? <laughs> Adrian, do you want to kick it off? <laughs> sure. Um, I mean, New York is is obviously a place where you know there's there's so much you know amazing and interesting stuff happening, and so I think that there is just by default, um, you know, I think I, I think audiences here for the most part are used to seeing really interesting and boundary pushing work happening. So I think that they're certainly open to um, new ways of experiencing. Uh, the performing arts in in whatever genre, but I also, you know, I think just to link it back to the time we find ourselves in now, I think the amazing thing for me has been, you know, seeing and also speaking with you know other artists um, regarding their experiences of what we've seen in the last few months, the this proliferation of of online content and streaming and and online performances, and I just think that there's a real hunger and a need for all of us to go back to more of the traditional uh, performances inside a house. Um, I don't think anything will ever be able to replace that experience. And, and I think for, for artists um, and for the way in which they engage with audiences, that connection, that magic that can only happen um, when people are in a room together, I think that's always going to be the best way or the ultimate way in which to experience um, a live performance. So I think there are always going to be interesting ways, um, I think, to rethink performance. Um, but I, I do think that it's an art form which was made for, um, you know, I think that kind of live interaction with between an artist and, and, it's, and their audience. I, I agree. I think, um, no, drive-in as a concept, whatever it's for, whether it's movies or anything else that uh, we can develop into, drive-in is, is a step backwards. Uh, concerts in small rooms are a step backwards. There's nothing wrong with that. It's actually a great time to try something that we haven't done for a long time and see what comes out of that, because we will start to go forward again. You know, this will pass. And when we start to go forward, if we haven't stopped to reflect, if we haven't explored some of the things that we haven't touched on uh, you know, for a long time, we'll have missed a great opportunity because all of a sudden life will be back at the pace that it, it previously was. Um, and I think now if we don't look at uh, you know, the, the innovation in the same way as the kind of retroactive view of, of what was and what we might have forgotten about, what we might have missed, uh, we're, we're missing a trick. I, I live in Dubai. That is not known as a center of the arts uh, around the world, but it is known as a city of the future. If you look at the architecture, if you look at the way a lot of the, the processes work, uh, it's very much geared towards the future. This is a chance for, for us here in this city, in this region, to think about the arts in a similar way, which up until now we haven't done. We thought about it in a traditional way, and, that, and that's fine. It's a developing uh, market. Um, but now, actually, we have a bit of time and we have this, as Adrian says, this influx of technology, all of these different uh, streams of, of various kinds bombarding us. It's kind of time to, to think about how we could use that in a, in a productive way going forward. Jay, sure, I, I, I think about yeah. you with infecting the city. Um, that's, that's right. You know, that just came to mind immediately of a different way of doing things. But go ahead. No, I, I mean, I think I want to go a little bit further back with that and just say, you know, in terms of our communities, um, I think in built in South Africa and in, indeed in many countries on the African continent is, um, you know, as a result of uh, the response to colonization, 
there there is um, there's almost like an inbuilt uh, DNA to improvise, right? To 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 make do to develop, uh, you know, the Iskatamia made famous with the Lady Smith Black Mombasa is as you know is a very good example of that kind of making do. And I mean, because Iskatamia was because. Uh, migrant workers were put into these tiny rooms and uh, because they lived in such close proximity with each other miners uh, they the they the, the dance the zulu dance the Mblamu and goma could not be done in full regalia so they they had to hold it down and keep the the, the, the formations quite small and to keep it quiet and this tatamia is also loosely translated as the dance of the cat and i think you know, it's a very good example of something where circumstances uh, do necessitate uh, invention, especially when the you know where there is such a lack, and in a country where you're dealing with so much lack, there is a, there is a propensity to find the solution. And um, I mean, and you, if you brought up, uh, in fact, in the city, yeah, that was, you know, it, it started off as a way of, uh, because it was originally the Spear Summer Festival, it was a way of taking art outside its kind of elite formations, which was on the Spear Wine Farm at that time, and to bring it out into the city. And, you know, uh, ironically, it was called Infecting the City, which is a, so, a strange play of words uh, right now. But but the, 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 the point here, I guess, is, uh, is, is not, is that the, the innovation is about the artwork, but the innovation is also about how do you interact with a variety of publics that's the you know that's the important thing is how to get to a kind of communication that is uh, you know with with all due respect to the kind of controlled communication one needs in a in a white cube or a proscenium arch stage um, it was to 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 create a kind of a discursive field with audiences so yeah to 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 answer your question i think uh, our communities for the most part um, it, it differs, but for the most part, are, are quite malleable in terms of how the art is, as long as there is some kind of attempt to to draw audiences in. Thanks for that, and and, and Jay, I'd like to to stay with you for another question um, that you touched on briefly. I want to talk a bit about where the arts sit in a pandemic in in a pandemic. Its role. Um, you and I chatted earlier in the week about how it's gone perhaps from a form of expression that is about healing, and it can be about healing, it can be about thera uh, therapeutic activity. Um, and, and now sometimes there's this push towards the commercialization of it just to keep it alive and to keep food on the table. Um, how can we not use this pandemic, but how can we work in the pandemic as a way to reprioritize to upscale as opposed to downscale arts as a part of the greater society in which we live. Is there, can this be an opportunity that's different for us as arts practitioners, as venue hosts, as, as uh, supporters of artists that we can push the arts to be a more key part of the solution as an integral service? Sure, that's a that's a really great question, and it's huge. But the the um, you know the 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 point I, I think you know just to cut to the chase of the of the pandemic of this particular pandemic is uh, with regards to South Africa that it reveals a crisis, and it's a crisis, of course, of the pandemic itself. But it's a crisis of what it reveals, and it reveals a deeply unequal society. Right? It 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 reveals the most unbelievable social justice issues and i think that and and then commensurate with that you um there is this uh, you know a number of artists have been up in arms because you know we only become relevant on in level one so that is how essential we are we are as essential as some kind of uh, entertainment so that, that, that those are the questions and it's you know it's not there's no ready answers and there are there have been answers and there's some really brilliant answers around online uh, work and working with an interaction designer to create to, to, for it to become much more interactive and not just watching a video after a video after a video 
online. So, so, th th so they are all of those. But the important thing, I think, is how can we use this space and this this um, to to go much more deeply into the those two major questions uh, the, to address because there's no way the, the, the levels of injustice and the levels of inequality in this country uh, 25 years after democracy can continue uh, and where so many people are vulnerable. And, and the second instance, how is it that if, it's, if, if art is so uh, essential in, in, in more classical African communities, in traditionals and in, in traditions, uh, or, you know, where, where interdisciplinary arts, the voice, sound, music, dance, d d uh, certainly uh, uh, ritual becomes part of a, a communal healing thing. How, how did we get so far away that we are now like a non-essential service. So, so it's it is linked to the, the the commerce, if you want. It is linked to the to the commerce because we're needing to find out what how did we create this specter where it has been narrowed. The audience has been so narrowed, and we're calling it a highly commercial op option. And yet, in in a in a pandemic, it reveals itself not to be. So it's to ask all of those difficult questions, and we're launching a series of symposia via uh, the ICA that will go all the way through to next year, as well as several fellowships that we are refashioning around uh, attracting artists and academics to, to just to provide space to think through this, because it's a lot to think through. Hmm. Hmm. Audrey and Jasper, do, you, do either of you have some comments or thoughts on that? Um, yeah, I mean, I, I think that the, the arts during this time, if anything, I mean, I think the performing arts is an incredible way to um, to reflect, to connect with, to inspire. And I think it has been, I mean, at least my experience has been that it's been so important for people during this time to still be able to, um, you know, connect and for artists to connect with audience, for arts organizations to connect with their audiences. I think that the the wonderful thing that this whole pandemic has created for for artists and arts organizations is it's kind of um, forced everyone to grapple with uh, the online medium uh, and with digital technology and you know has kind of sped up the development of 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 how we engage um, with with online performances. Um, I think that it's I've seen some wonderful things where um, you know artists have either started. Uh, performing online or having Q and A's and having discussions online, um, you know, teaching masterclasses, connecting with with their followers and audiences and communities, and in that way, it's it's been I think a, a really important phase for for us to to go through, to take stock of, as we said earlier, I think, um, you know, just just the importance of live performance. Whether it is in a concert hall, whether it is uh, in uh, you know a, a more informal outdoor setting or in, in other ways, um, but I do think that it's it's been a it's been an important phase for us to to reevaluate how we connect with audiences, um, and and really what are the stories that that we can tell, and 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 what you know how can we how can we build that? How can we put the best version of that out there? Um, so I think lots of lessons learned and, and a very, as I said, just a really important period for us to, to go through. I would, I would echo uh, all of that, I think, and, and only add, speaking as a member of the audience, not as someone connected with putting on performances or shows in any way, but just as somebody who enjoys going, I miss it. I really miss going to the theatre, going to a concert, seeing a, a dance performance. Uh, and if I'm in any way representative of a larger group of people, that means, you know, hopefully there are many, many, many millions of people around the world who are also desperately missing the chance to go and enjoy those stories being told. If there are new stories that come out of this, if there are new ways of telling those stories through technology, fantastic. I, I would sincerely hope that the creative people around the world are busy creating as we speak. But as a member of the audience, I just want to get back to enjoying it in, in the live room. I want to be able to see stuff uh, with my own eyes as well as on the screen. And if I can just add something, I mean, I think it's 
just thinking about this webinar, for example, I mean, I think it's so amazing that, that Cape Town Opera, that you guys are doing this and, and to be able to just talk about these issues. Um, if, if we didn't have uh, the pandemic, a project like this probably might not have happened. And, and it's that kind of interaction and dialogue that I think, you know, this has all sort of sparked, which is so important. Um, so, so again, I just, I, I think it's, it's an important time for us to reflect and to think about how can we do things differently? How can we engage with new technology? Um, yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm enjoying this, um, the ease of this backstory, whereas these conversations normally would not be had. We wouldn't have time. It wouldn't be public. It's not something anybody could listen into. Um, I've been talking to a couple of South African singers I want to bring in uh, in the future. Normally, would, would we have a chance to sit down with them, with, with, with Levi Sekapani, with Sunny Boyd Ladla, and say, talk to us about what you're doing every day? Um, oh, and anybody can listen to that. So I, I really enjoy the, the, the backstage uh, nature, the sort of personal uh, way we can now interact with arts practitioners and artists um, that's... But, but as Jasper, as you said, everyone just wants to get into a venue, whatever that might be, and watch it live. It feels like we've been having lots of wonderful snacks and we want a, a great meal. Um, again, that's, that's what we want uh, in the world of arts. Jasper and Adrian, let me, let me shift a little bit. I want to ask both of you a bit uh, about the buildings, uh, the facilities in which art is generally uh, takes place, performing arts, and um, obviously anyone can, can jump in here. But are there ways that we can present live art that can keep these buildings open and financially solvent? There's so much about repurposing uh, venues, of course, things like the convention center here now is becoming a place for 850 hospital beds, which is wonderful um but that whole notion of taking the theater the performing venue the black box and repurposing it at this time should we be doing that should we in fact say nope they just have to stay the way they are um and when we get back to live theater that's what that's what our job is how do you feel about the venues in terms of covid and post-covid in terms of presenting art jasper do you want to Go first. Sure. Um, I think, um, oh gosh, I, I think you're right. It's wonderful that venues are being used for other purposes uh, where that is the case, if, if that is possible and appropriate. Um, uh, it is also right that because of funding models or, or other reasons, other venues simply can't. They, they have no option but to go dark. They, they have to close. Uh, for hopefully a, a limited period of time uh, rather than on a permanent basis, but for now at least they have to close. W where there is the possibility uh, to do something a bit different, that's great, but it, I don't think it, it can be a pressure on anybody. The, the funding uh, model is what is going to drive it because right now nobody has yet come up with a commercial uh, way that, that these things can function uh for themselves if, if they're not funded uh people are not able yet to to monetize them the 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 system that we have at the moment we have a you know a, a thriving live or had a thriving live industry around the world that was basically run on on ticket sales revenue and then we have a thriving uh tv and film industry uh that works on advertising uh and the the two don't often connect there are a few examples that there, there have been obviously live opera and, and all sorts of other performances streamed for a number of years now but for in financial uh, terms they don't really cross over uh, terribly well it's, you're either in one or you're in the other and, and you fit the model accordingly and that means now when when we're having this uh, pandemic uh, if we're on the live side, what else can you do with a building? And, and I mean, it's early days, potentially. There may be some brilliant ideas out there. There may be some things that are just starting now that could lead to a, a kind of hybrid model or a new way of monetizing uh, the arts so that they can keep going uh, in venues, even if this pandemic were to continue for a, a very long time. But right now, I don't, I don't see them. I'm not aware of, of any great examples of that. 
if I, can I, can I, oh, sorry. I'm I'll sorry. be quick and then. Th th no, 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 forgive me. Um, I think that the, just the, the basic challenges, the economical challenges, you know, um, and as Jasper also pointed out of what we're going to be facing when we go back, um, you know, when we try to reopen uh, is, you know, are going to be immense. It's, especially in a place like New York, I think that the, the ecosystem um, of how the arts works and the various groups that are involved, um, you know, it's just stage production, labor, you know, all of those things are incredibly expensive. Um, and I think most organizations, uh, you know, here, for example, would have a really hard time and it in all likelihood not be possible to reopen with social distancing in place. Um, there have been in, incredible examples. I mean, I think of um, uh, the uh, theater in Wiesbaden where Albert Horn, a, a former Captain Opera uh, chorus master as well works where they've, they've been able to put on recitals, um, you know, with a small fraction of the audience, the, the potential audience, you know, in the house. And I think, I think, we're going to see more of those kinds of um, ways of, of trying to come back and trying to open our halls. But it's financially, I mean, it's, it's, it's really challenging to do that in a place like New York. Um, and, you know, of course, it's to be seen how opera companies and orchestras are going to deal with social distancing and what that means. Um, but there's always, I think, you know, always an opportunity for us to rethink the buildings, how we engage with the spaces, um, you know, are there other ways in which we can think outside the box of opening up spaces, having fewer people in those kinds of things? Jay? Oh, I was uh, just going to, I, I, you know, and please, uh, you know, spare me. I'm talking specifically about South Africa in a, a you know, in a very particular and peculiar country, which uh, went through the the romance of uh, democracy and all of that in 1994, and has still not been able to deliver a, a democracy to its peoples. Um, and you, you know, and so we have all of these uh, relics of uh, of apartheid, these massive, massive buildings, which for majority of the peoples of this country, it doesn't mean that much too. So I, I think that the question also has to go deeper um, again around architecture, and what does that, uh, you know, what does that, what, we have all of those buildings, all of those buildings that have been constructed. Are an art as a, you know what I call architecture of exclusion rather than inclusion. It is it, it, it by the by ver the very nature of its bombastic style uh, and its and its excesses. It 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 excludes because only as you uh, uh, rightfully pointed out that it can it needs uh, it needs funding, um, and and I think that. You know, I'm not saying that we do away with these buildings, but I think we shouldn't, you know, the, 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 the vulnerability of people right now is so high in everyone's minds and the, and the deaths and the suffering and all of that. I think it's time for us not to be, to be courageous about asking the really, really difficult questions as to to what extent do these buildings, if they, you know, in the middle of a pandemic, can be so, un, so unusable, um, what does it mean to think about to to think about space and architecture in ways that are more inclusive that can be can that can be more, and especially in and especially in this country because I think that the legacy that you know what we have uh, what we have. Um, uh, received as a result of the colonial legacy in terms of all of these buildings, it, you know, it, in, in many respects, it just kind of stays there and we keep finding the big productions to go in there. And somehow that economy does not work with, 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 with the people. So there is, there is almost a kind of a, an unspoken of um, 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 d default or an unspoken of uh, um, uh, missing. There's a there's a note missing here that you know we're not we're not addressing. Uh, that that I feel that we're not addressing in this country. So I think that the question of buildings is an excellent one. And so it's a it's a it's a it's an excellent one also to take on the conversation with a lot of courage about how how and who these buildings serve. Uh, 
<clears throat> yeah, I mean, the, I, I think about the, the, the main municipal theaters that are in, in South Africa and in Cape Town and Bloom and, and Durban and Joburg and Pretoria. And anytime there's a production in there, uh, you, it's either subsidized or incredibly high ticket sales. Very infrequently does it have the, the, the commercial marketing money behind it that will allow for either free access or low access. Uh, Jasper, going back to your model, which is, you know, it's either ticket sales, subsidy, or marketing uh, branding that's going to fund this art. And, and these buildings, I, I'm curious, Jay, what would you do if you were running? Uh, we've got a big building, we have a big municipal theater. How would you approach this disconnect between, as you say, I mean, generally South African society and these large scale buildings, which have tended to perhaps exclude a lot of people for whom the art is meant? What would you do? Well, I, I'm, not, I'm not an architect or by any, any means, but I do think that, that the, how these how these buildings position themselves spatially as these spaces of exclusion, that's that's a really really important place to start. Uh, how people access them, who and where, you know, and where they come from. So so it's it's not it's not easy. It's it's not uh, it's not um, uh, that it's not going to come come extremely quickly but i do i think that we need to just own up to the fact that many of these buildings are filled with all kinds of musicals that are you know that are being pulled from from other parts of the of the country and make it, and and they you know they sell out and they sell out for a particular group of people that can afford to 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 go there but how is this actually shifting the, hu the, the humanity of a country, I don't know. You know, how is that commerce? The, the, the disconnect I find is the disconnect of the, between, you know, between the humanity of developing the humanity of a country and, the, the, and its commerce. So why isn't the economy speaking if, it's, if it is articulate? So, so my, you know, it'll go back to that, that you know, how is this economy speaking to the human to the to human issues, and um, with the economy heading the direction that it's going already with COVID, I think that it, it's an even stronger question. It's a, it's even bigger question, of course, with no answer, no particular answer. But um, I, I mean, I think the whole notion of buildings and the structures of, in which art is performed is is almost an unanswerable uh, thing to discuss. But it's it's as important, uh, it's it's definitely got its place in the discussion in terms of art in a post-COVID world and the audiences where we perform it is is a big question, um, and we've seen that shift to online, which has taken over since we've had these buildings closed. And in the home that Cape Town Opera is right now, they've had to shut down to the point of they were open, I think, just a handful of hours a week to, to for broadcasting. So the nature of the work that those buildings are allowed to do changes so quickly and we know that in the work that we do in dance orchestra opera um we we work way far in advance it's very hard for anyone here to pick up um when the rules are changing so quickly put on a, a new production um you know in a very short period of time it's almost impossible but um I, let me just move away a bit from the building question uh, I want to work back to questions more about some commercialization and some monetization of art. Um, and something that I'm always curious to talk about because it's, it can never, uh, it gets people going one way or the other, is talking about sports. Um, let's talk about how we've seen plenty and plenty of soccer stadiums that are empty, almost empty, yet we're watching that match on TV. So that's one particular sport that has gotten itself to an audience in a way outside of the physical structure of a stadium, but it reaches a lot of people. So my question is, is there a reason that the arts hasn't really been able to replicate that? Does it want to replicate itself to do it that way? If not, why not? Um, are the numbers even out there? in terms of worldwide audience to buy tickets to watch the art that we create as opposed to attend it live or in addition to attending it live. 
I'd really love to know what your thoughts are on all of this. Adrian, go for it. You're in New York. I think of the Met broadcasts. Um, good, bad. Do we want to even go there? I mean, for me, it, it comes back to what I think we, we discussed in the beginning um, briefly. I think that the supremacy of, of the, the live performance with audience um, is an experience that, you know, you can't replicate. I think artists need the audience to feed off of. And I think the audience wants to give back to the artist. And that in a nutshell for me is I think the magic of the arts. And I think, you know, that is why great artists, whether it's Maria Callas or Frank Sinatra or Judy Garland, they all had this incredible ability to, they're like lion tamers. They, uh, you know, they're able to whip up an audience. They're able to uh, kind of overcome whatever prejudices or baggage or uh, preconceived ideas the audience may have. And they have to kind of grapple with that on stage through the music and then overcome. They have to sort of win the battle. Um, opera of all the art forms, I think, um, is the one where you 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 have? I mean, it's a it, it's a sport, a figurative sport in a way, and because the challenges are so big, the the physicality of it is so big, um, you know. So I I don't think that we'll ever be able to fully realize the the true meaning of of what opera or live performance means if we don't have that artist audience interaction. Um, you know, I think that the the made opera broadcasts you know they're incredible i think and just thinking back now to when they started i mean it's so wonderful for an organization like that to have the back catalog of full performances to now use during a period such as this when we're not able to put on live performances um you know but those performances are filmed in front of a live audience um you know, even though in the theater, you know, it's it's different because you don't have the artist in the room with you when someone sees it in a, in a, in a movie theater. But I, yeah, again, I just, I come back to the point that I don't think that there's an equal. Um, and I, 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 I don't know, I think it, because of, of all of what I just said, I, I think that the experience of a sporting match or, um, you know, any other kind of, of sporting event is is very different in its very nature from from what the arts represent when it comes to live performance yeah i am um, i saw a comment the other day uh somebody had, uh, had done the done the numbers uh for the uk and uh it was something like five times the number of people in the uk uh in any given week go to the theater than go to a football match. And that tells the story because obviously when you take in, into account the TV audience, it, you know, it's, it's a completely different story. Soccer and, and many other sports work extremely well and indeed are now made for television. That they are made to be consumed on whatever size screen we have. The theater, the opera, you know, the, the arts in general, performing arts are made to be seen by people sitting in the room and that that connection is all important and that's why so many of them go they buy a ticket and they go and enjoy it and it doesn't mean you can't enjoy it on the screen of course there are other ways to consume but at least in terms of what people have gotten used to how the model uh, have evolved that is the difference and it's very difficult right now to try and sort of take one and, and force it into another and say, well, let's just do more streaming and, and let's just put more on the screen. Um, I, I don't know that that's the, that's the answer. It's, it's an answer. It's a, a way of getting more art out there and maybe there's a way of commercializing that. Um, you know, the, the, not just television, the, the computer, the thing that we're all on now, the, the rise of e-gaming, uh, that kind of sport compared to yeah. a physical sport uh, is extraordinary, and the arts are starting to move into that. I, I saw there was a, I think Travis Scott and two or three other artists were appearing on on shows on Fortnite. You know that is a computer game that 300 million people around the world yeah. uh, regularly consume and play. That is a yeah. that is a phenomenal audience for for anybody for anything, and you know maybe there are innovative ways to to develop in in those kinds of directions. I, I don't know yet, but in terms of how things are and the way people are 
immediately used to what they're thinking, it's very difficult to, to transition from one into the other. Mm. I mean, I, I don't mm. think any of us want to get rid of live performance. I think all of us agree that that is the ultimate um, and that should not be replaced. The question is, should we be adding to it in the way that we had radio dramas decades ago, our parents all, we, I mean, I, I remember growing up and listening to the radio dramas uh, on Sunday nights. Um, that was an additional way of listening to something that I could also go and see on a stage. So the extent to which within the arts, we're willing to invest more resources and time and energy on it. That's, that's what I'm wondering. Jay, do you have any thoughts about this? Sure, I, 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 I must agree, though, that the, you know, the, I mean, it, it, I suppose it's just an unfortunate uh, kind of comparison with uh, with a soccer match because of, you know, we, I think all of us you know, have this antipathy to the, the the levels of sponsorship that go into 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 sport, and and in this country, it's uh, no less. Um, but I, but I, I, but I also do agree that if there are ways in which we can reposition um, reposition uh, the, the art so that you know that it has uh, more more access, more you know larger purchase. I you know the the, the two examples. I Artie Patrick performance artist, did a quite an obscure performance artwork in the Cape Town uh, in the Long Street Baths and uh, in, in this uh, large swing pool with you know with massive rafters of and you know there were I think there were about 900 people a night queuing up to come and see this uh, this performance it was you know of course it was part of the infecting the city vibe so there was that there was all of that but it really you know it it, it is when when the work happens, like the uh, Mamela Nyamza, also a, a kind of performance artist whose work was commissioned for Montpellier Festival, so it was you know it was very uh, uh, in the realm of live art uh, and performance art. We performed that, uh, a curated that in front of the Cape Town station, and there were hundreds of people watching it. Hundreds of people were drawn were, were drawn to it. So of course they weren't paying for a ticket to come and see it, but the the, 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 the hunger and the thirst for for this kind of work is is certainly there. And therefore how do we shift uh, these uh, these modes um, uh, you know will become more and more important you know this is not the only pandemic and and uh, I think it, it it brings up more and more questions about opening up our vocabulary for access and not simply you know because there was a time in the first couple of weeks I was like I just want to get back I want to get back to the office I want to get back to the hitting hall I you know we had all of these these productions planned I you know I and it wasn't to be um, and it's just interesting, I don't want to take up too much time, but I, I also run a community development program uh, with Suela Sonka, the dance theatre, in uh, m many uh, spaces, rural and township in, in KwaZulu-Natal. And we have trans... Um, we have changed the, the the transport allowance to data, right? So on the on the on the line item, it now appears as data. And so people in very very difficult areas have this access to data, and they are creating. They're creating uh, performances, and of course, most of them are solos. But they're creating uh, performances that I don't think I will see in a dance studio. And they're creating them in the in a in the sh in a shack in the bedroom in the you know in a in a cave in a you know in 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 these incredibly uh, in spaces now I'm just talking about about one example of where where the artist is creating within an environment that 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 when you take them out and put them into a dance studio a lot of that actually gets lost so the you know what it's you know it's one of the ways in which this crisis and the as you say opening the vocabulary for access becomes a you know it it really made me think that many of these 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 dancers many of these performances would be completely lost in a in a kind of a sterile you know white matted studio where you know it would be completely lost if they didn't have this um, the 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 the, the, the the kinds of context that they were performing in, and there is just something in that. And I, you know, it's too early for me to kind of say, you know, what exactly is it? But I think it is part and parcel of this extending of the vocabulary. 
Hmm. I mean, it, what would be interesting is to see the those new forms of presenting art that once we get back into our, our more traditional venues, what are we going to keep that we started new now? Uh, or are we just going to go straight back to what we did before? Uh, who knows? We'll, we'll have to see about that. Um, but Jasper, let me g have a question that I, I want to ask you because you've been in, a, in an interesting situation where you've headed uh, some major performing arts venues and now you are running an arts consultancy, which is a, a, a very different set of, um, of, of work that you need to do. I'm, I'm curious, between those two, running a venue and running an arts consultancy, which one do you think, I don't wanna know, I don't wanna say that more difficult, but which one do you think is gonna have more scope to adapting to this post COVID uh, world that we're heading into eventually? Um, as an arts consultant or running an arts venue? Gosh. Um, <laughs> I, <laughs> tough one. I, it is tough. I think my, the, the vast majority of my career has been spent, you know, with a, with a very nice roof over my head of one kind or another. Um, <laughs> it certainly gets challenges uh, every day and every year that you're, you're there. You're, you're faced with kind of all kinds of new things to, to think about and to uh, plan for and, and to try and improve on. Um, the, the world of the arts consultant, uh, firstly, I'm relatively new to it, um, but the breadth of uh, clients that I, I have at present means that uh, I'm certainly no less challenged than I was running a venue. And in fact, possibly more so the, the variety of uh, questions that I have to deal with, um, particularly at this time where so much is uncertain. And I'm dealing on the one hand with people who are thinking about, well, what kinds of content uh, should we be looking to program when we can uh, to people thinking about exactly what we talked about before, what kinds of buildings should we be building? Uh, I'm, I'm doing, you know, feasibility studies on a number of different uh, buildings and opportunities at the moment, um, and it's it takes an awful lot of thought to think about. Well, as you say, are we going straight back to what we had? Is it, is this just a temporary, uh, a lost year or whatever it's going to be until there is a vaccine or, or an effective treatment or something else that means uh, medically people feel confident enough to uh, to, to re-engage. Uh, in exactly the same way, um, or are we going to take some of what we've learned, possibly because we're anticipating that this might happen again, uh, or for another reason, into the future? And, and if we do that, how do we need to design these buildings? What sort of capacity should they actually have? What range of programming should they be built for? Are they Should they be absolutely genre-specific or... or should they become even more multifunctional than you know the trend has already been taking a lot of places? Um, I, I'm dealing with all of these things on a daily basis, and and it means a an extraordinary uh, range of things to to think about and to try and assess. I don't know that there's a right answer, and and I certainly don't know that I can immediately say that one is harder or, or more challenging than the other. Um, as I say, running a venue uh, for, for as long as I did. <laughs> there were enough um, enough interesting days, shall we say, enough interesting nights. <laughs> um, but it's a, it's been a great transition for me and, and a great way of uh, continuing to to develop my own thinking about where we might be going in a number of different fields. Mm. Mm. I, th I mean, I, I think about running an opera company, the orchestra here versus Artscape, you know, there's the two very different things and, and, and the ability to adapt to where we're headed is, is something that just takes a lot of creativity. Um, Adriana, I don't know if you, in your experience running festivals and now in working in the hall, do you have any thoughts on that? Um, I was just, all of a sudden, as you were saying about, you know, I think the, um, the differences and the innovation that's required and I think linking up with the point that Jay made earlier, I think um, just something that that struck me and, and from my own experience um, in South Africa and then coming to the US, 
in South Africa, we have the incredible privilege of, um, you know, I think working in an arts environment that requires people to be so flexible and so innovative. Um, and you get exposure to so many different facets of the art form. And I think, you know, I, that is something in my experience, at least that I've, I've felt here in the US is very different. So, I mean, there is no doubt in my mind that, you know, I think South Africa and South African artists and, and arts practitioners are gonna absolutely seize the moment and find interesting ways of connecting with the community. Um, I think that for me, you know, everything comes down to the stories that, you know, any arts organization or artist can tell and how they can connect with their communities. Um, it's, you know, talking, thinking again about the building and how do we engage with the building? Well, you know, how do we take it outside of the building as well and use these digital tools and mediums to engage with audiences? And I'm thinking, you know, it's in South Africa where you have, you know, choral competitions, uh, or, you know, choir competitions and singing competitions. What is that going to look like in a, in a COVID-19 world? Is there a way that you can take that online, for example? Is there a place for Cape Town Opera within that kind of um, landscape? Um, how can you have opera uh, singers give masterclasses online? Those kinds of things are, I think, the things that are going to augment the, the live on stage performances and are going to help sort of strengthen the roots of any arts organization and artist within a larger sort of community. Um, but yes, it's j just to come back to New York, it's, it's very different for each organization. Um, there are a lot of similar challenges, but um, it's going to be interesting to see how organizations seize this moment and I think remain authentic, um, which is also something to keep in mind. I think that that is, that is something which, you know, we found, you know, I think at Carnegie Hall is, you know, we've purposefully said we're going to be very upfront about the challenges that we face. I think audiences respond very favorably to that. Um, and yeah, I think I think we we there's a lot of there's a long road still ahead for all of us, but I think an incredibly exciting um, opportunity awaits all art, artists and art practitioners. Mm -hmm. And I think when artists um, already have so much noise around them telling what they can and cannot do um, to retain that authenticity, as you say, of telling the story that they want to tell, it's even harder now. But out of that will come some fascinating stories um, yes. and I think it's up to us as as the the venue hosts or the educators or the funders or the audience to allow for that space for artists to come up with fantastic stories that they're going mm -hmm. to dance they're going to sing they're going to play mm -hmm. uh, for us I want to just go into as we get into the last couple of minutes here I I want to shift away and I want to ask a bit of a a more of a fun question for you guys, just to put it on a on a a bit more of an upbeat note as we go ahead. Just think a bit of Desert Island Discs or Carpool Karaoke Time. If you could, in a year from now, be the intrinsic part of putting on a fantastic performance, what would it be? And where would it be in a year from now? That title is yours. Um, the art form is yours to decide it might be new, it might be existing. What would you want to put on and say, yep, that's my project. I did that. That's a tough one to end with, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> it could be small. That's a lot of silence. I'll, I'll go for it. Dream we, uh, In Dubai, we were, we were due to have uh, Expo 2020 this October, and uh, it's been postponed, so I already have something to look forward to. And assuming that it will be possible by then in, in the same or, or a similar form, I am most looking forward, not just to, to being involved with that, but uh, to attending it and to see what all of this creativity might drive us towards over the course of the next 12 months, because we actually have an opportunity uh, with this uh, you know, extended uh, break to plan a little bit harder and to think about some other influences and how they might be represented uh, across so many different nations in an artistic sense within the pavilions of expo on the uh, community stages and for this country 
to be able to host that and to be able to see the the kind of the efforts that everyone's going to put in i think is actually going to make it even more exciting than it would ordinarily have been and and i'm not going to do all of that but i'm certainly going to be involved in it uh, and, and i can't wait Great. I would, for me, I would have to say, um, so th the next big festival that I'm planning at Carnegie Hall is called Voices of Hope, Artists in Times of Oppression. And it's one of our big sort of citywide festivals that we do. Um, you know, so we've got, I think, 16 concerts happening at Carnegie Hall. And then we partner with various arts and cultural organizations across New York City, um, from the Metropolitan Museum of Art to the New York Public Library. Um, and the festival is taking place from March through May of next year. Uh, and, you know, I, I think if I had to choose one thing next year that, you know, obviously I want to have happen, you know, it would be that. I think we've put together an incredible schedule um, and there's some wonderful artists performing as part of the festival. The big challenge is just we don't know yet. We don't know when we're going to open. We don't know, uh, you know, how this is all going to affect our season um you know by next year obviously we we all hope that we'll be up and, and up and running but we just don't know so that would probably be the one that i i would like to see happen great jay um well uh you know the the, the live art festival that we're we do uh which was supposed to happen in september and october is going to be moving to February, April, um, March, April next year. And I think that there are some projects there that will be wonderful to 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 see, um, to, to make happen. But I think that the, the, uh, the, the, most, the most exciting um, um, trajectory of work, because I, I, I really feel like this is gonna be about an unfolding. I don't, you know, as, uh, as the other two speakers have, spoke, uh, have uh, allu uh, alluded to, it's difficult to, 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 to see this, you know, there's travel, there's, there's, uh, uh, there's social distancing, there's, there's just so much. But I, I think that the, the new brand of fellowships that we have launched uh, is going to open up some really important territory around around uh, classical African art um, healing uh, audiences, um, infection, contagion, uh, surveillance, and most importantly, around issues of intimacy uh, during the time of COVID and, and, and after. And how do we, I think one of the big things that we aren't taking into account, I'm sorry, you wanted to get this all light and upbeat, but one of the things that I, that we, uh, <laughs> we have taken into account is a kind of post-traumatic stress that's going to, that's going to envelop many of us. So, you know, we are just looking at statistics when the, the calamity actually hits us. Anyway, so, so, so I think that the you know there are many artists that are moving into those kinds of areas already to and to bring this through in uh, in uh, in very decentralized spaces. So those little solos that I spoke to you about in you know in a in a little home in Malazi uh, to have those replicated in various ways, whether it is online or uh, in various homes throughout the country. So yeah, to find those, to link those fellowships and the thinking behind that with, uh, with the very necessary healing that we're going to need to have. It's interesting because each, each of you did not choose a one singular event at one place. You each chose a, in a way, a festival, something that was multidisciplinary, something that was multi-venue, um, something that, as as Jay, as you say, is a fellowship. And I think that's particularly interesting. It's much more community oriented. Um, it, it's the big meal. It's not the one part. It's the big meal of the arts. And it's interesting that you all are looking forward to that. So. I wanted to say, uh, as we're rounding out here, Jay um, in Durban and Audrion in New York and Jasper in Dubai from Elise in Cape Town, it's really been fantastic having, uh, having you here. Thank you so much for your time. And uh, we've had some comments here saying very interesting discussion, uh, fascinating comments, really looking forward to what everyone's saying here. and. Thank you again for taking part in our Cape Town Opera webinar and for your fabulous ideas for 2021. Thanks again. Thank you so much. Thanks a lot. Okay. Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye.